So today it's our great pleasure to host Sir Anthony Orr, who is uh, very well known in computer science circles, obviously. Uh, one of the great inventions, the quicksort, which Dijkstra actually said was one of his top 10 inventions in, in a talk he gave here once. Um, but for our course, more importantly, for uh, having invented Hoare logic, which uh, much of what we do in our course actually, uh, on what, uh, much, much of what we do in our course is based. Um, so, welcome. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Maybe you can take us back uh, to the you know, early 1970s, late 1960s, and tell us a little bit about how you stumbled upon all these very important insights of yours. Well, I, at least I can reconstruct the story. <laughs> I can do this. Um, well, my first job was with a, a computer manufacturer, a small computer manufacturer, writing a compiler. Mm -hmm. um, the, the language that I was um, chose, or the company chose to implement, was RL60, mm -hmm. which was the first language to have a well-developed syntactic method for describing the grammar of the language. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, everybody recognized that that was a very great achievement and very useful in conveying understanding of what, what was allowed to be written in the language and what wasn't. Um, but could they do it for the meaning of the language, the implementation, the semantics of the language, not just the syntax? There were conferences in Europe, perhaps primarily, um, on the subject of um, uh, how to extend this formalism for description of semantics. And I, um, as a compiler writer, um, didn't want the language to be too closely um, defined, because otherwise it would become machine dependent and um, manufacturer dependent. Um, the way to do it is axiomatically, by stating what properties you think your um, implementation should preserve in the programs concerned. I was a disciple of Esker Dijkstra, like you, mm -hmm. and um, so I had an ideal that a, an axiomatic definition, um, which could be used for reasoning as well as for understanding the execution of programs, would be the most useful one because it would enable the programmer to write programs which does did what the user wanted, um, and at the same time leave freedom to the implementer to implement it as efficiently as possible on the machine that was available. Mm -hmm. That was my argument, anyway. Um, did people buy into this from the beginning? Or? They, it, it was quite popular, but okay. um, to begin with, and then it sort of fell out of um, fashion. Um, <clears throat> But I, I, I kept on to it. Um, I wanted to continue the research in this area, um, axiomatic definitions, but I realized that the application of the results of the research was unlikely to be of use in industry for many years to come. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the right place to do the research would be at a university where you were not required uh, to deliver uh, products useful um, knowledge or of products um, at least not a short, short time scale. <laughs> um, and I was quite young, 35, at the point as a professor. Um, and so I wanted to choose something that would not be of use, would last me as a research subject for all my life. 32 years it was going to be. Um, and I reckoned that um, Proving correctness of programs would be just such a, um, a subject because it obviously is a very academically correct thing to do, an academic challenge, challenge but wouldn't be industrially useful for 32 years at least. Well, uh, the professorial appointment that I applied for entirely experimentally, not expecting to get it, just get the experience that was offered to me, and I accepted it and went to Belfast. Mm -hmm. 1968. You're still very proud of the fact you were there. I, I was there a couple of <laughs> years ago. And ah. The first thing, as a matter of fact, they made me give a talk on formal derivation 
in addition to my other talk specifically because they were very interested because of your hand in the legacy, I should say. say. Yes. Anyway, continue. The, um, as I was un unpacking my papers from moving into a new house, I discovered a previously neglected manuscript that Bob Floyd had sent me, mm -hmm. um, which was a roneographed uh, copy of his article on deciding meetings to programmers. Mm -hmm. And I immediately thought my previous attempts at, uh, at axiomatization were, were um, as nothing compared with the insight that, that uh, Floyd had mm -hmm. as to how to um, assign meetings to programmers. So I um, made that the subject of my first article as a professor in, in, in Belfast. Um, and it was called The Axiomatic Basis of Computer Program and Axiomatic Basis. Um, and it's been referenced quite a number of times. Mm -hmm. And indeed, that was the subject of my lifetime's research. And um, when I actually re reached retirement age, um, I got an offer of a job again from industry, Microsoft Research. I was opening up in Cambridge, a new job. I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to see whether my prediction was correct or not, mm -hmm. whether people were um, using the techniques. Uh, now, when was this? This was in 1999. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I went up there and I visited the development division, and indeed, I found that my prediction was correct. Mm -hmm. I was uh, nobody using floor logic to verify the correctness of program. Um, but they were using assertions. Mm -hmm. that's, yes, of oh, okay. that's maybe first step. That's first step, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Specifications um, and so on. No, they weren't using assertions for specifications. They weren't using assertions for top down development of algorithms like you do. Mm -hmm. Um, and many sensible people do. Um, they were using it to help in program testing. Mm -hmm. uh, program testing was something I'd been preaching all my academic life against. Um, I don't think anybody really likes program testing very much. Um, but the advantage of assertions is, of course, you can put an assertion in and then you can get the program tested overnight mm -hmm. and you only get a, a, an error report if the assertion fails. And then, um, if you're trying to chase a bug, you can put more assertions in around the place and find out exactly where, or not, more closely mm -hmm. to the actual occurrence of the bug, um, it will be detected. Mm -hmm. So you can home in on, on, on the actual. Well, a lot of people use loop invariants. They just don't use loop invariants to derive the loop. They use it as assertions again. I think that's um, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <coughs> so and then what happened was the virus was discovered, and the virus has a property. Firstly, that it could, can cause billions of dollars of damage to the international economic mm -hmm. equilibrium. Um, and secondly, that it can reach places in your program that you never even believed were there. And uh, so they set up, they bought a, a company which provided a, a program analysis tool called Prefix. Mm -hmm. um, and it took over the people and they adapted it um, and scaled it up to the um, mm -hmm. enormous sizes of Microsoft software, which is then having 20 million lines of code. You know. <laughs> Anyway, they got this through, um, and um, it became more or less mandatory um, that everybody had to use this tool. And the tool was, um, I made friends with the person who designed it, John Pickus, um, and we had grand plans that we would put assertions into this tool mm -hmm. and um, integrate the assertions into the program testing process so that people would be encouraged to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they did that. Um, but but this still sounds like it is an a posteriori process oh, cool. where you insert this after you've already written the code, as opposed to using it to help develop the code. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. I know that's a very long way away. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I think you've, you've selected an, an area uh, of application in which the solutions just need to build because Correct. Your, your, your algorithms are reasonably regular. Yes, and it's um, a family of problems for which this lends itself very well. And it, it, yes. What's exciting is for each operation you get lots of different implementations which of course is much more fun than having one pop out in the end. I, th I think so. <laughs> and, uh, I, I think it's an yeah. absolutely standard way in which um, science, even the pure science, can, can really um, deliver its um, benefits to engineering. <laughs> engineering can find one solution to a problem mm -hmm. that suits a particular client at a particular take, uh, time mm -hmm. you know, within the particular budget. Um, not, with not science, that. hopefully, we can science, give them all the solutions. You give them all the solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and that means you, you, have, you become a much better, more flexible um, engineer. Well, what we're hoping, of course, to do with this course is to teach the masses how to think this way. And then they can take it way beyond just linear algebra. It's either that or I have to take it way beyond linear algebra. And I'd much rather have somebody else take that on, because it's a scary world out there. Indeed. But uh, when, uh, when I visit uh, your university, other universities, and a number of mm -hmm. industrial establishments, or attend a conference, or um, go to a discussion meeting, I was a discussion meeting on the Royal Society a few weeks ago, there are, there's a mass of incredible talent and interest and enthusiasm and idealism, mm -hmm. uh, which is now being um, uh, directed on the kind of problems that we're just leaving behind. Mm -hmm. well, well, we hope to equip people with at least some tools and some skills. Yes, you do. I'd like to thank you. This has been absolutely delightful. We have a very yeah. busy schedule, so we'll let you get on. Let other people benefit of your wisdom. But thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been very, very nice. Thank you.